I would like to describe a field in which little has been done, but in which an enormous amount can be done. This field is not quite the same as the others in that it will tell us little of fundamental physics, but it will tell us much about the strange phenomena that occurred just below our perception. In contrast to the natural philosophers of the past, the scientists of this field delve into the recesses of nature and show how she works in her hiding places. Their quest is to understand and create the imperceptible. After all, there is plenty of room at the bottom. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Materialism Podcast. I'm joined today by Jared and not Andrew, who is sick with food poisoning. Yeah, I, uh, you know, I sent a text last night and I said, oh, you coming to the episode? And I wake up and I see, what episode? <laughs> a green, goes, green barf yeah. face emoji. He goes, uh, you know, I've had food poisoning for two days. And I was like, oh, okay, that makes sense. I can see why you didn't respond to our texts. So we're going it live without him. Andrew, we hope you get better. Just wanted to quickly jump into some exciting podcast news. Anyone who's listening on Apple Podcasts right now, if you go into categories and into science, I think we're now number 10. <laughs> we did it. Yeah, we're number 10 in chemistry. <laughs> we went from number 200 to, yeah. I don't know what, turns out we had our categories set incorrectly, possibly. Yeah, we were in <laughs> education or something. And we're like, but ah. we've now fixed it. Yeah. So I'll tell you what, if you want to see us climb, if you want to see us be number one, please go and leave us some reviews. It is the only way that we get noticed on iTunes. iTunes is very finicky, so leave us all the reviews. Talk about how great the Jared specials are, how I'm the best host of all, <laughs> anything like that. We have such a cool episode today. So we're going to talk a little bit about energy storage broadly, and then we've got a really cool new and emerging sort of type of this energy storage that we're going to get to in the latter half of the show. So we could do episodes on all these topics, when it comes to energy storage, there are so many options out there. There's fuel cells, there's batteries, there's mechanical storage, thermal storage, there's supercapacitors. There's all these different things, right? Really briefly, we want to talk about some of the pros and cons of these different ones and realize that we will gladly do some full future episodes on some of these, like fuel cells, for example. Uh, it's a no-brainer, thermal storage. So, Jared, fuel cells, tell me about them. So, fuel cells, obviously, at the time being, are a hydrogen-based fuel cell for the most part, and they're a great useful technology. The biggest downside, at least that you can look off the bat, is that they're mainly used in cars right now. And I don't know where you live, but if you don't live in California, good luck getting the hydrogen. Yeah. So they're actually, you know, it's funny when, whenever you say like hydrogen fuel cells and realize that you have a hydrogen source of hydrogen in your yeah. car, these images like the Hindenburg exploding in flames. And this is so well, not the case. Well, right? They made such a big deal. If you like look through the technology, like there's a Toyota Mirai, yeah, they went out of their way to say, look, Here's crash test, crash test, crash test. Because they, I think everyone has this image that it's a hydrogen bomb because they don't yeah. understand how hydrogen works necessarily. Yeah. M a buddy of mine worked on these tanks for storing them, and he showed us all the different ways that they tried to get them to explode. And anyways, I'm not saying it's like a 100% solved problem, but it is not probably what you're thinking either. That said, fuel cells do have some disadvantages. Most of the time, these things operate at high temperatures. When you move things to high temperatures, you've got corrosion, durability, thermal expansion, you know, just wear and tear. It's tough to make these things operate, and they tend to work at higher and higher temperatures. I saw also, just a really quick anecdote, this weird thing. They made the, they're working on this super yacht right now that does the opposite. They freeze the hydrogen, or they lower the hydrogen so much that it's liquid, and they use it as a propulsion system. Oh, wild. I've seen people do um, hydride storage, so they'll actually make the hydrogen bond with a metal, so it's a metal hydride, mm -hmm. and now it's not in a gas phase. It's in a solid phase, and if you can make that reversible, so they'll absorb them to zeolites and different things. There's some clever ways to store the hydrogen. Where does the metal go in that case, though? So it bonds with it. It forms a metal but after, hydride. after, when you split no, it. No, it stays. Oh, and it so stays you, forever? Yeah, and so the hydrogen gets released, right? It, mm -hmm. It's a function of pressure, basically. Yeah. So anyways, fuel cells, pretty cool technology. They have some pros and cons. They are not quite as efficient as batteries, but they are still very efficient. Um, I think they're still fighting problems with safety, but in fact, that this is something we can get over. Um, pretty cool technology. And obviously hydrogen you could get from lots of places. You can do electrolysis of water. And so this would be a really cool renewable source of energy uh, or, or a way that you could take renewable technology, split the water, and then store it on site with a fuel cell. So this could complement the renewable energy generation as a renewable energy storage technology. Now, we've got batteries, too. Tell me about the pros and cons of batteries, Jared. Well, obviously, off the bat, the gold standard of battery is it's the lithium-ion. The lithium-ion is the ideal battery, and it's only the ideal battery because it's the best we've been able to get so far. Just but amazing energy density. Yeah. But it's not without its problems, right? For no. one thing, take a look at the cathode. Cobalt, 
nickel. Like it's got some materials that are not only expensive, but sometimes associated with conflict, not sustainably produced. Yeah. Um, there's some issues with that's why, batteries. And that's definitely why companies, if you look at like Tesla, their, their big focus was trying to remove the cobalt because not only is it, of course, prohibitively expensive to acquire, but like you said, it's a, it's a product of conflict, which means at any moment, you could just lose complete access to it, which kind of ties back into what, you know, Andrew and I were talking about the last episode, which is material supply lines definitely affect oh, yeah. innovation. And there's some other technical problems with lithium-ion batteries, right? As you move away from some of those cathode materials to others that are more sustainable, it often comes at the expense of capacity fade. Anybody who's mm -hmm. had a, a, you know, a, a cell phone and found out that two years later, it's basically not charging Yeah, so the beans. Whenever they recharge, there's a bunch of issues. There's losses, right? And so lithium-ion batteries are okay, but they're not without their problems. And there's lots of other types of batteries. Well, and there's obviously lithium-ion is just one flavor of batteries. You've got lithium-sulfur, sodium-sulfur. You've got metal hydrides, you've got lead acid, you've got all sorts of wacky types out there. Um, and these have some sort of pros and cons. Energy density, power density are different trade-offs you see but, with them. But none of them have that kind of usage, really, that you get out of the lithium ion for the most part right now. Yeah, the main thing with all these that you're going to get is, depending on the materials used, you're going to have a relatively high cost. You can get, I, there's some exceptions to that, you're getting pretty good energy density, but most of the time you're getting poor power density, right? So these sort of Rigoni plot where you plot energy density versus power density. Batteries tend to be on the energy density as mm -hmm. their plus, but their downside is typically low I know power that the only, the only one that, I can, that comes to mind that I really see often is a lead acid battery because a lead acid battery is in most cars. But yeah, low cost, um, has some nasty materials in it. It's rechargeable though. Yeah. There's, there's some advantages to it. That's also obviously, uh, if you guys see is your batteries you know, get older. They, if you ever see a battery burst, yeah, it is gross. Not nice stuff. It. Yeah. Um, now, there are other, you know, there's some non-electrochemical ways to store energy, right? You've got mechanical storage. Uh, the two that come to mind right now, you've got flywheels, right? Take an object. We know that it takes energy to start something rotating. And obviously, as you move that weight, you can increase its rotational inertia. So you can store more energy in a, in a flywheel. The heavier it is or the faster you spin it, and so if you have a vehicle that has regenerative braking, many of these actually rely on uh, ways of storing energy into flywheels, right? You can take that energy, you can keep that thing spinning, and then you can convert that back to uh, the power as it basically imparts that energy back to the wheels and start moving again. Yeah, we were having a conversation that's also, uh, there's this thing that's called a kinetic energy recovery system, and it's in a lot of F1 cars. And it's really interesting because it takes that same idea, but the thought is instead of using it to help start the car go, you use it in moments when you need that extra burst of speed because, of course, there's the instant torque of a motor, and you combine that with having just a small burst of power, and it works perfectly. Now, regenerative braking is actually kind of a broad term. You've got one that actually it takes that via motor and converts it to chemical energy yeah. in a battery, or you just put it in mechanical energy, and that's this curse which yeah. you just described. Now, that's mechanical storage. There is another one. There's pumped hydro. This is actually the cheapest, right? When you see these plots of, like, cost of energy to storage, mm -hmm. like, it blows everything else away. Pumped hydro. You just pump water up a hill, up into a tower, up into a reservoir, and then you let it come back down later. Where is this used, I think, is my All over question. The place. All over the place. If you have a reservoir nearby, they use it. But you can also do it in cities, which have water towers, right? They can yeah. pump it up into the water tower. But obviously, the downside there is that... You've got a water tower. You've got a water... No matter what... This is going to take up a lot of space because you have to store yeah. this liquid somewhere. This was the argument I saw against it. The guy was talking about the need for underground storage. He was selling a different technology, yeah. but he basically said, like, where are you going to put this in New York City, right? Yeah. Like, where's that going to go? So in a small town, it's great. If you're by the mountains, you've got a reservoir, great. But it doesn't work for everywhere. Also, what would the power loss be from pumping it up or letting it come That's down? The other downside is you have big losses. So batteries are great. They can be yeah. extremely high efficiency. But this, basically, you're you're pumping it up, and that, you know, carnot efficiency is going to be what it is. It's mm -hmm. not going to be great. And then you get losses again as you convert it back to power on the way back down. So you're absolutely right. They're not as efficient, but they are cheap. Yeah. Now, you've got another form of energy, which is thermal storage, right? So I think we will definitely be doing an episode on this in the future. So I'm not going to say too much about it now because we've got a guy in my department that does some cool work on this. But the idea is you can take energy and from heat and you can store it by either heating your material up, maybe melting your material. So now it, some of that energy goes into the latent heat of the transformation as it goes from a, a, a solid to a liquid, for example, or salt, liquid to a gas. Um, but you can store quite a bit of energy thermally and then harvest it later. Maybe it's for load leveling. Maybe it's trying to make your home more efficient. It's basically going like to keep it warmer system? later. Like a heat pump, exactly. Mm -hmm. So I think we'll do a future episode on this, but that's another way of storing energy. 
And then the last one we're going to talk about are supercapacitors. What are these, Jared? Oh. Well, what's a capacitor? Maybe yeah. step back. Uh, yeah, it's like, what are you so a capacitor, I think that's probably a lot of people listening to know, is an electrical engineering component. And what is different about a capacitor as opposed to a lot of things is that its goal isn't a sustained release. It's one quick release. If you do the math, I went through electrical engineering, and I remember the awfulness of having to do those time-based equations of the charge. Oh, yeah. But, yeah. There's a, so that kind of makes it special, and then obviously you add super to it. What do you think it does? <laughs> but I mean, at its most simple, picture this. You've got two sheets of paper. You hold them near to one another, but not quite touching, right? Imagine if you could shuttle electrons onto the surface of those. Now, it can't be paper because it's got to be conduct electricity. So now yeah. you've got metal plates, right? Mm-hmm. So this is this. You've seen this before in your intro to MSC textbook, the parallel plate capacitor. And at first they show you what it looks like if there's nothing in between. If it's just an air gap. And then we got smart and we realized, oh, you know, it turns out if you put a material in between there that is polarizable, you can put more charge on the surface, right? And so these are materials that we now give it a name that have a high dielectric constant, which is going to increase the amount of charge and therefore the number of electrical, you know, like electron carriers on the surface of these plates. Um, Now that's the parallel plate capacitor is big parallel plates. And obviously that doesn't work for a lot of geometries. So instead what they do is they take these and they roll them up in this so-called jelly roll design. Um, So what supercapacitors do to go beyond that is they find ways to dramatically increase the amount of charge that you can put on these, either with a much higher dielectric constant, but also through huge increases in surface area. So you will see them using things like carbon nanotubes, nanostructures, all sorts of things to basically cram a ton of surface area into what looks like a small area. The downside of supercapacitors, obviously, is what we kind of talked about, which is they're great for doing small, quick things. If you want to just like quickly start something and move it, but if you need like a very extended battery, it doesn't work. They're not a long-term storage solution. Yeah, in a lot of ways, they're the opposite of batteries. Batteries were, again, high energy, but low power. Mm -hmm. These are the opposite. These can deliver high power, but it's hard to get a lot of energy there. Yeah. So it's not like it has to be one or the other. And actually, we have a guest coming up after the break who's going to describe how these can be used in conjunction with some other systems and specifically how their supercapacitor is really changing the way that you think about supercapacitors in terms of the form factor and the geometries that they can access. So more on that after the break. Today's episode is sponsored by Matt Match. Matt Match is a company that's passionate about material science and whose goal is to connect materials engineers with materials providers and suppliers. Their platform gets used by a million engineers each year. Best of all, searching for that perfect material is completely free for you materials engineers out there. So head over to mattmatch.com and check out how useful it might be for your next engineering project. The Materials and Podcast is also sponsored by Materials Today. Visit materialstoday.com to stay up to date on the latest happening in the materials science field and read some of the fantastic articles that they've published. Obviously, with such a big technology like this, there's tons of articles there. So check it out at materialstoday.com or elsevier.com. All right, so we have just talked about some of the basics of energy storage, which sets the stage for our conversation now with Joe Sleppy. So, Joe, first off, give us an introduction. You are the CEO of of Capacitech Energy Incorporated. Joe, tell us about yourself. How did you get involved in this? Hi, well, thanks for having me here, Taylor. Um, my name is Joe Sleppy. I'm the CEO of Capacitech Energy, and ever since I was a young engineering student in high school and in early college. I've been fascinated by energy storage, energy transfer, and really all things renewable. And so uh, I started my first company in high school where I was making hands-free fitness equipment for people like amputees. And I really fell in love with this entrepreneurship concept. And when I got to college, I wanted to continue doing entrepreneurship type things. And so lo and behold, I found a lab that was doing uh, high-tech research in this field. I got involved and you know, four years later, I'm still running Capacitech to commercialize a wire-shaped, flexible supercapacitor, which is an energy storage device that has applications in clean tech and wearables and everywhere in between. So really excited. So cool. High school, man. I was not doing that in high school. I was out being a high schooler. <laughs> Good on you for getting an early start, man. That's very cool. Well, yeah. 
Joe, before we dive into uh, all the things this is good for, tell me how on earth this product works. What makes this different than the capacitors that our listeners now know and love? Yeah, so traditional supercapacitors are these radial soda can-like components, and they're restricted to use on printed circuit boards. And the body of that supercapacitor takes up surface area on the circuit board, and that surface area is valuable in a lot of applications. And so if you have five capacitors connected together on a circuit board, you're losing the surface area to add new features or to make that circuit board smaller. And so Capacitex innovation is to change the form factor of a supercapacitor. Instead of it being what looks like a soda can on the circuit board, we've created a flexible and wire-like supercapacitor where the body is off of the circuit board so other components and features can be underneath it or so that you can route the supercapacitor through the free space available on the circuit board, maybe even having the positive and negative terminals connect on opposite ends. Or for my personal favorite is put supercapacitors where they've never gone before, such as in the wiring infrastructure of the product and system, rather than restricting it to use on the circuit board where space is valuable. Wow, that's pretty wild. I could see why, you know, other engineering disciplines, not just material science would get psyched about this because it unlocks sort of approaches that would have never been possible for. You can redesign your circuit board. You can use spaces in a vehicle or whatever else that were dead spaces before. Uh, that's pretty cool. Uh, it's one of the things I like to talk about is that the advantage is a placement advantage. You're, you're opening up all this creativity. Uh, a lot of engineers, I'm an electrical engineer by trade, and you're trained that the circuit board is the canvas, right? You put components here to accomplish something. And with our technology, we're freeing engineers from the, the circuit board. They, they now have another vehicle to put supercapacitors into to add value, to add more uh, capability, or maybe even to readjust how their products are interacting with their users. So uh, this is awesome. And I love that it's just yet another example of material science unlocking a technology for other engineering disciplines. So to that point, what is the materials research that made this possible? Because you've, you've drastically changed the form factor entirely of a capacitor. What's the material mm -hmm. science going on there that you can talk about? Yeah, so the material science uh, started with a lot of uh, nanotechnology research being done at the University of Central Florida. And we were lucky enough to be granted a grant from the National Science Foundation to start exploring how to make this commercially feasible. Was this and an SBIR, STTR or something? Yeah, yeah, we got an STTR grant in 2018. And the point of that grant was to convert the academic and lab scale prototypes into something that is more rugged, producible, um, and, and frankly, repeatable. And so uh, we started working with our CTO, Isaiah Oliday, who completely reimagined the form factor. And that original research paper uh, talked about a coaxial cable form factor. We actually found that with the coaxial cable form factor, you get an increase in capacitance because there's additional surface area between the cathode and anode than if they were just parallel plates. And so that's one advantage that comes off the form factor right away. But then further diving into that, we were able to leverage a, a, a electro manufacturer that's nearby us named Sezon Thin Films, who had engineered particles that helps bring some nanotechnology advantages into our electrodes to achieve really, okay. really great performance. So yeah, anytime that they move towards these sort of nanostructured objects on the surface of materials, the question I always have is like reliability and robustness. How, how are these actually going to survive? Will they accumulate mm -hmm. together? Will they break off? Will you lose connection? Like do you, especially in a cable, right? You're making mm -hmm. cables. These things have to flex and bend all the time. Like what sort of robustness do you have on those nano features? Yeah, and that's actually, I think, really what sets our technology apart. There's conformal and there's flexible. And when you have a conformal capacitor, you bend it around something and then it stays. Uh, with our technology, we bent it thousands of times and saw only a difference in tolerance in performance of the capacitor, right? So uh, we have a truly flexible supercapacitor here. And I think that a lot of that comes from uh, the material innovations and the design for manufacturer, the thought that went into how we're actually going to construct this uh, and that coaxial cable form factor, uh, you know, with the way that this product is designed, it's not, it doesn't have all the components frozen in place so that there can be no give. Uh, we expect each material, the anode, the cathode, the separator uh, to stretch when it needs to, to compress when it needs to. And that's how we're able to achieve a great flexibility rather than something that's conformal or uh, potentially fragile by nature. Very cool. And you're able to do this while preserving pretty good performance. Talk about, so our listeners are probably familiar with the, the so-called Rigoni plots, right? Where you plot energy density versus power density in one way or another, mm -hmm. either on a per mass basis or per volume basis. How do you guys perform with other supercapacitors? Are you 
are you better or are you basically similar but with additional functionality? Where are you at? What's cost look like? Where are you guys at? Yeah, uh, so our, our, our capacitor performs very similar to the capacitors that are already on the market. And I had this great question asked me in 2018 when we were starting the company, which was, do we want to make the world's best supercapacitor or do we want to make a flexible wire-like supercapacitor? And what I said at the time was, let's make a flexible capacitor that we can prove can be manufactured, that we can prove uh, ruggability for, that we can prove commercial interest with. And then once we have a piece of infrastructure, a manufacturing line figured out, uh, a method for scaling, then let's go adopt higher performance anodes, cathodes, and frankly, electrolytes to achieve the best performance. And so right now, our capacitor is on par with the industry average for, uh, for capacitors. And I got an email this week that said some of our higher performance electrolytes have arrived for prototyping. So, uh, so cool. we're going to continue to move that up to get to higher voltage ratings. And the higher voltage rating will also inspire higher energy densities and higher power densities as well. So, so uh, we're excited to unlock additional possibilities with our product. So your overall goal was more to change the form factor and how people use it before you started focusing on improving the actual product itself. Yeah, and the way I was, that I think of it is there's a lot of really smart people working on material science innovations for energy storage. Uh, you've got hundreds of startups, hundreds of universities, and hundreds of corporations all trying to make the world's best battery. That's great. It's incredibly important work. Let them do that. And what Capacitech sought out to do was think, all right, where does energy storage need to go? If we're going to have a truly clean, net zero environment, we're going to need energy storage everywhere. And I don't know about you, but I don't want a block of batteries in my garage. I don't want a block of batteries in my city. When I see IoT devices, they should be seamlessly integrated into the building. Wearables shouldn't have an awkward box hanging off the side of your glasses. Everything needs to be seamlessly integrated. And all of this stuff requires energy storage. So let those companies go build the world's best energy storage materials. And what Capacitech has sought out to do is create an infrastructure that we can adopt those material science innovations, the best electrolyte, the best cathodes, the best anode, the curved graphenes, whatever it might be, adopt those materials that these companies are coming up with and say, hey, we can adopt that into our manufacturing process. That way we can help your energy storage component go into the infrastructure of the world so that we can expand energy storage outside of the space. It's typically dedicated for it. Cool. So I got to ask, uh, I know you're a startup and things change all the time and you're probably changing your line regularly. Um, hope you are. That's innovation, how it works. What does this look like in terms of cost, though? Like, how are you, you know, is it 10x higher? Is it the same? Is it 10x lower? Where are you at? Uh, yeah, right now, I'd say it's two to three times more expensive than the commodity produced supercapacitor. Um, one thing with supercapacitor market, though, is you'll see wild price fluctuations even in the same product line um, as availability comes and goes, as automotive companies make their big purchases and things of that nature. Okay. Um, you know, and so our, our capacitor is currently available on Mouser Electronics, which is a, which is a distributor. And so um, if you compare our cost to the traditional cost, yeah, it's two or three times higher, call it an innovation markup. Yeah. But uh, right, right now, the big goal of the company is we have this existing manufacturing line that we're planning to double and then triple. And scaling up our capability sure. or production capability is also going to significantly drive down our cost of goods. We haven't even started using quantity scale discounts yet. Right. So, so cool. you, you compare us to someone that's producing hundreds of millions of units a year, uh, you know, there, there's a, a, a scale of economy benefit that they're that they're taking advantage of that we haven't started to yet. So um, I expect our cost will come down. I also have to imagine that the technology required to make these these nanoscale structures that are actually flexible probably cost a lot more like the actual equipment to machine it. Well, yeah. Tell us. Can you to the degree that you're able to? I don't know what what you want to disclose, but can you talk a little bit about the process of making this? the manufacturing of the wire shaped capacitor starts by wrapping the cathode around the core wire. You wrap the separator around that, you wrap the anode around that, creating a coaxial cable form factor. And that coaxial cable is what you have uh, storing the energy. And so if you think of a traditional battery or a traditional supercapacitor, you have a parallel plate and that parallel plate may be jelly rolled into a soda can, but you still have a parallel plate and there's an electric field running between that parallel plate in our design, we have a coaxial cable and the energy that is stored is from the electric field running between the cathode on the core wire and the anode wrapped around the separator, right? So physically and electrically, the same things are happening, but it's doing it in yeah. a, a collinear coaxial cable form factor versus a jelly rolled parallel plate. 
So is the downside to that, I guess if people want different gauge wires, that's a different product line you have to offer. You can't just like jelly roll that a few more times. That's a different product line to offer. Yeah, we've experimented with the different sizes of, of wires and what we're offering on the market is what we found to have the most optimized performance in terms of, you know, low ESR and a high capacitance. Um, one thing that has been asked to me by investors and customers is they'll say, okay, well, what if we want to use a two gauge wire versus an 18 gauge wire? You know, what, what's the difference? And, you know, one thing is when you use a larger core wire, it means you're increasing the surface area of the cathode. You can't use the same size cathode for a very, very small wire as a very, very large wire, right? right. And so when we adjust the, the sizes of the cathode and the anode proportionally, by doing that, you actually might be increasing the surface area of the cathode, which leads to additional performance, right? Capacitance is proportional to the surface area of those electrodes. And so, you know, we've seen advantages to using thicker wires versus small wires even. Yeah. In the videos I saw, your your wires were a little bit chunky. Uh, maybe that was just the one you had on hand, but they were, uh, what is it, like half a centimeter or, or so thick? Like these weren't super thin uh, wires. Yeah. The wires right now are about six millimeters wide. Okay. Yep. There's something so funny about six millimeters wide being considered chunky. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's how far technology has come. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Joe, I've got, I've got lots of other questions for you. This is such a fascinating technology. One thing that comes to mind is competing technologies kind of doing the same thing. It's not the same. I've seen structural capacitors, right? This idea of, or structural batteries, sometimes they call them or massless batteries, right? So uh, there's been some papers we're going to put a link to in our show notes, but what if you've got a carbon fiber layup, right? And then you take that carbon fiber, you paint an electrolyte on it, and you paint a cathode on it. We all know that many batteries use carbon as an anode and so if you've got this carbon fiber can it work essentially as your anode um, that's what some research teams have done they've done some pretty cool stuff um, they paint basically a fiberglass and then a iron lithium iron phosphate on the other side and you've got a lithium ion battery and it's a structural component now it doesn't mm -hmm. work as well as some of the others that we've seen uh, they're getting something like 20 percent of the capacity of a typical lithium ion battery mm -hmm. but they have a something like a 25 gigapascal stiffness which is just wild so how does your com your technology compete or synergize with some of these other approaches that are coming online? Yeah, uh, I actually love it when I see technologies coming out on that front. And the reason is because they're, they're, they're really validating my mission and my vision for why we started Capacitech. And that is to build energy storage into the infrastructure of the world. We're doing that with a wire shaped form factor that can go on a circuit board, that can go in the cable running between different modules in an IT server, that could go into the UPS backup power cord, as well as the photovoltaic cable in a solar farm, right? As, as well as wearable applications. There's so many places that you can put a wire. But if you're going to make something like an infrastructure battery, it's a little bit harder to produce the same product over and over and over again that's going to go and be applied. And so with our individual capacitor, it's 120 millimeters long, six millimeters wide, features at least three farads, and that's the building block. You know, if, if you have an application that's very high power, connect more in series, connect more in parallel. Cool. If you have something like a wearable that's lower power, you only need three or four, right? But with the, something like a structural battery, uh, you, you have to design and plan out a little bit more versus have something that's uh, more mass manufacturable that can be used really according to the designer's creativity or imagination. And so that excites me about what we're doing compared to what other people are doing. But I love to see someone building something like the hood of a car is a battery. Great. You know what else is a battery or a supercapacitor? The wiring infrastructure of the car, right? The wiring harness. You have energy built and stored on the surface of the vehicle. Great. You have energy built and stored through yeah, the dude, wiring harness so of the cool. vehicle. And now, now the, the batteries that are in the chassis, uh, great. Now you have even more range. Or maybe you don't need as many and that can lead to a more affordable car or something of that nature. So uh, I think it's great when you see technologies coming out for structural battery and it, it strikes the same chord that Capacitech is building, uh, is going with, which is to build an energy storage into the infrastructure of the world. So let's, let's move towards applications then because my mind's just like whizzing with all the things that you could do with these. But maybe before we do that, just give me an idea of how much energy we're talking about in one of these. In a fully charged module, right? You said whatever it is long, you know, mm -hmm. one of these units, uh, what is it? Three farads and 1.5 volts. If that was on a headlamp, right? A typical headlamp, like what sort mm -hmm. of life are we talking about? Is this, or maybe compare it to like a cell phone, something that people are familiar with, right? Uh, we know a typical cell phone has something like 2000 milliamp hours or something like, where are you at? And are you way less? Are you more, where are you at with that? Yeah, well, and that's the difference between batteries and supercapacitors. And so a battery is designed to deliver a little bit of energy over a long period of time. 
while a supercapacitor is designed to deliver a lot of energy very, very quickly. And so if you did nothing but charge up a supercapacitor and try and power something like a headlamp, that supercapacitor is going to discharge and it's going to keep the, the lamp on for a period of time, but it's not going to compete with the battery. And that's because the battery has a high energy density or the supercapacitor does not. The supercapacitor has a high power density, but the battery does not, right? So and so this is the engineering trade-off that engineers are faced with. And let's just use something like a drone or an electric vehicle uh, or, or even an IoT device. And I think an IoT device makes a lot of sense here. If you have a IoT device so that is- pulling... way, That's internet of things for, for those that aren't familiar <laughs> with it. Right, so, so you have a sensor that's going to wirelessly transmit information over, the, over a cellular band. Well, for 90% of the time, that sensor is going to draw less than a milliamp to be in its sleep state. And then for 0.1 to 0.3 milliseconds, it's going to wake up and it's going to draw two amps. And that's to gotcha. send the information over the, over the, uh, the wireless communication waves. So like narrowband IoT. And so in that scenario, the battery is perfect for powering that sleep state. But if you're using something like a five milliamp hour battery or a 10 milliamp hour battery, that two amp draw is going to really shock the battery. And now you get into the design trade-off. Well, do I use a battery or a supercapacitor? You only have so much space on your circuit board. You only have so much space in your enclosure. So a traditional supercapacitor might make you give up certain characteristics or certain uh, features on that circuit board to make room for it. And so with our product, we can help uh, alleviate that trade-off where you have space for both batteries and supercapacitors or one or the other. And something that's also that getting very popular is you pair something like an indoor solar cell, an energy harvesting device with the supercapacitor to serve as a battery alternative in IoT devices, for example. An ideal energy storage system should feature both batteries and supercapacitors, something that's able to provide the pulses of power and the bursts of energy, as well as something that provides that long lasting, long sustaining energy. And you can look into the differences yeah. of uh, cycle life, temperature ratings, an ideal energy storage system will feature both batteries and supercapacitors. And it's one of the things that our innovation is primed to help people yeah, do. That just makes sense. So help mm -hmm. me understand what are some other applications where you need high current draw that, that you're... Uh, technology could potentially unlock. IoT is a great example. What else is out there? Yeah, so IoT is out, is out there. You have drones, you have even uh, things like solar power systems. When, uh, if you have a, a, a solar power, uh, I'm sorry, if you have a solar panel on your RV and then your RV is connected to a lead acid battery. And then when you turn on that air conditioning in the, lead, in the RV, that lead acid battery has to deliver this surge, this burst of energy. And lead acid batteries don't like doing that. Even if it's a lithium ion battery, Great, it might be able to do it, but it's putting stress on the battery. Building the cable capacitor or supercapacitors into the wiring, connecting the battery to the inverter. Now that surge of energy, that burst, is coming from the supercapacitor instead of the battery. And that'll actually help extend the operating life of the battery uh, and, and, and also help you maybe even use smaller batteries if needed. So to material scientists that know very little <laughs> about uh, circuit design and that, how easy is it, is it to get the best of both worlds, right? Is it just as simple as connecting the battery to the device via one of your cables, or is there much more going on that we don't understand? Uh, yeah, so it kind of depends on uh, what the application is and the level of power. If you connect our supercapacitor into the cable, um, it would make sense to maybe put buck and boost converters, something to drive the voltage down and pick the voltage back up uh, based on you know what your design characteristics are. Um, some designers think it's really important to have uh, balancing in, in place as well. Um, and so it can be as simple as replacing one and adding supercapacitors in in parallel. Uh, and it can get very complicated depending on how uh, specific the design needs to be. Um, if you were going to design something that's going to go on a military drone, I'm sure you're going to make sure there are far more redundancies in place than for something that might be in a consumer product. Yeah, so yeah. I think that depends a little bit on the application. Is there any applications that you haven't seen yet that you think you would like to see your technology be used for? Yeah, that's what I'm working on right now. Um, maybe that means I'm not answering the question, but one of the things I'm really excited by is there's this trend in smart glasses, right? And one of the challenges with smart glasses is where are you going to put the energy storage devices and without making the glasses crazy? And so with our technology, what if the safety strap that connects to the back of the glasses that you, oh, you see cool. boaters wearing yeah, a lot the so they can take yeah. it off? Hmm. The safety strap is the supercapacitor, right? We just put a little neoprene sleeve around the outside of it and you'll never know the difference. Um, so I think that's a, a really awesome application. Another one is talking about uh, things like GPS trackers or 
um, that go on shoes or even like self-adjusting exoskeleton and self-tying shoes. A traditional supercapacitor, a traditional battery, it's not going to fit in the tongue of your shoe. You don't want to step on it. That's walking on a hard battery. But what if it was routed around the outside sole of the oh, shoe? Cool. The flexible supercapacitor can accomplish that. And so now you're you're combining functional design without sacrificing comfort or the sleekness of the shoe, right? Um, and then one more that I'm just, I'm waiting for, it's coming. Uh, exoskeletons are getting more and more popular. There are cables that are connecting the motors and the batteries to the, you know, integrated into the exoskeleton suit. And I see all those cables also being supercapacitors. And particularly every time you turn on that motor to assist the user, that's a burst of power, right? And then that battery is going to be drained. So I think that uh, using our supercapacitor, our, our wire shaped flexible supercapacitor integrated into the Dude, wiring cool. harness to the exoskeleton, now you're going to extend that operating life and the battery capacity on a daily basis going from maybe six hours to eight hour use life. And I think that would help uh, a lot of exoskeletons find more commercial traction for that eight hour workday. Gal, as you were describing form factors, we had a ski goggle company. So we, uh, we have some electrochromic technology we developed and patented. We have a company called eChrome. We want to make these rad ski goggles, which can electrochromically change their tint in real time, which is rad. There's a few out there on the market right now. We pitched it to one of the big manufacturers. I don't think I can say who. Um, we pitched it, and they loved it. It was, it was, in terms of performance, it was better than what they'd seen. Uh, there was some advantages, but we had this big old 9-volt battery on the side of it, and they're like, well, that's got to go. Everything's got to be live inside the frames. And we were like, where? Where, where do you put it? So, I have an idea. Uh, yeah, man. I wish, <laughs> I wish that we would have talked a lot sooner. Uh, that could have saved us a... Uh, yeah, we basically abandoned it because we had no idea where to put this, uh, had no idea. Yeah. And again, space and aesthetics, it matters, you know, and, and the battery industry is so focused on energy storage materials and it's important. I'm not saying that's not good work to do, but where are you going to put all this stuff? Yeah. You know, where are you going to put that it works? I and mean, imagine smart cities, picture a smart city. Do you see something beautiful or do you see a bunch of black boxes on every wall? Right. When I think of a smart city, I see something that's beautiful and I see technology integrated into the existing infrastructure of the city. I don't see awkward boxes hanging off of street lamps. I don't see, uh, you know, boxes on the corner of the curb that are counting how many cars go by. Right. I see everything seamlessly integrated in technologies like structural batteries that you mentioned, but also wire shaped supercapacitors connecting the loads and the sources. I think that's what the best way to go about making sure that our world stays beautiful and seamlessly integrated. I think that's really, I really liked when you said that earlier, and I was going to touch on, I like that you recognize that you don't have the end all idea that you have to combine a lot of different, you know, technologies oh, yeah. to reach this goal. And I think that's really cool to see that, you know, you're willing to admit that. Cause I think a lot of people think that their idea is always the best idea and that there's nothing else that needs to work with. Yeah, I, I can tell you, um, it was actually advice my dad gave me when I was uh, 16. When I started my first company and, you know, I, I, I was talking to him. He goes, listen, a smart entrepreneur, smart founder is going to surround themselves with experts in their field and they're going to build a team that executes. It's not you. And uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. And now with Capacitech, we grow by partnership. We don't grow by telling everyone that they're wrong and we're the only way forward. Uh, I, I, I take a lot of time to try and listen to other companies, understand their approach um, and see how we can integrate our technologies to be better together than they'd ever be on their own. So uh, a pretty big partnership mindset over here at Capacitech. That's rad. Well, Joe, thanks for the discussion, man. Sounds like a really cool product. I hope all the best for you. A startup in the hardware space, man, it's a scary prospect, but it sounds like you guys are doing it. That's exciting, man. Well, we're doing it. We're going to keep, keep doing it. And like I said, we got this vision to build energy storage into the infrastructure of the world. And uh, I don't think it's going to be something that happens overnight, but it's not going to be something that we stop doing overnight either. So cool. Here's to the future. Best of luck to you, man. Appreciate it. Big thanks to Joe Sluffy for this really fascinating interview. Uh, we're grateful to Capacitech Energy Incorporated, who's actually sponsoring today's episode. You've heard about them today in this conversation. I'm just going to point out that they are building unique power storage capabilities inside the world's wiring infrastructure. They're giving customers better, smaller, and more reliable products with new capabilities. Um, their flexible supercapacitor technology, this cable-based supercapacitor, I think is pretty unique and 
pretty amazing. It's shaped like a wire. It lets us do things that we couldn't do before, and it was fascinating to learn about them on today's episode. Now, before you go, if we can beg you to leave us a review and check us out, connect with us on Instagram, on Twitter, on all these different places. We are trying to make more and more content available and interact with our audience. It's fun to hear what episodes you want us to do next. I'll tell you what. I've got a backlog of videos that I haven't gotten around to. Once I'm done with this move, I promise you we're going to get some nice demos up soon. Be killer. And then, little secret, we may be working on a nice little blacksmithing demo soon. A nice throwback to an early episode. We'll see, though. Yeah, we've got some cool things in the works for the summer. Um, thanks again. You can reach us at, at materialism.podcast on Instagram or materialism.podcast at gmail.com. And obviously, go check out the people that make some of the music possible and our sponsors because we couldn't do this without these sponsors for the show, and we're grateful to them. Yeah, so, so a huge thanks to Colabite. Huge thanks to Alphabot, too, for making the music. And, yeah, go check them out. We have their links in the description. I think that's really it. Have a good one, guys. See you next time. The adventures of fire, electricity, magnetism, iron, lead, glass, silk, cotton. The makers of tools, the captors of lightning, the architect, the engineer, the musician, are all beneficiaries of the materials of this world and are bound only by their imaginations in manipulating those materials.